Um, as I've said, this is about building safety into design and all the issues and challenges that come along with that. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, if you've got any questions, please uh, uh, submit those via the WebEx system and then we can explore those at the end. Um, also, if um, another important point, if, um, if there isn't time to cover any of the questions that, uh, that you submit, um, we can always look at them afterwards. Please contact me direct and we can, uh, we can deal with those. Okay, let's get the presentation underway. Now, I'm going to be exploring a number of themes um, and a number of, uh, I suppose you would call them different focuses or foci. Firstly, I want to start off by talking about some design events. Many of these you may well be familiar with, but um, they're very interesting to explore again, and so I'll take you through those in a moment. Then we'll be looking at the um, constructive challenge hopefully not destructive, challenge between a creative solution and yet a safe solution. In my view, uh, there is no challenge. It just requires a lot more thought. Then we'll look at um, built environment projects in particular, uh, followed on by rail infrastructure projects, and lastly by the automotive sector. These sectors um, have different experiences, different ideas, and different ways of um, dealing with this issue. So I think it's worth exploring all of them. Then summing up with the, the whole question of assurance and leadership in relation to design. I've got some uh, thoughts on that, some may be provocative, some hopefully challenging and interesting, um, and then we end up with a Q&A session. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, let's move on now into the next slide. Right, design events. Okay, um, this I am sure all of you will probably have seen the video to do with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, an absolutely fascinating and catastrophic uh, collapse of a bridge. Then we'll look at another bridge, which is the Box Girder design. Um, this I got more familiar with myself when I was doing my uh, first degree at uh, Brunel University in the, in the late 70s. Um, the Challenger Space Shuttle, again, very, very uh, widely covered, uh, but again, interesting to understand the, the, the background to it. More recently, the French trains and the misalignment with station platforms. Basically, they didn't fit. Uh, Formula One, again, I've followed Formula One out of uh, personal interest over decades, and it's fascinating to see how they've been dealing with the whole issue of safety and uh, uh, and the steps that have, they've taken over recent decades. So we'll look at these in a bit more detail, one by one. Now, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, um, I've got a quote here for you. Um, uh, at the time, it was in the, in the 1940s, and uh, it operated, it actually worked, it was open for four months, um, certainly three months in particular, and people were using it. Motor vehicles were driven across it, um, and uh, uh, the uh, anecdotal uh, stories at the time indicated that some people quite enjoyed the idea of driving across this bridge that wobbled um, uh, rather interestingly as you went across it, and some people actually sought it out to, for the experience. But um, that was all very well, but then um, uh, there was this terrible um, time when there was a gale coming up the up the gorge, and it, uh, it uh, encouraged the bridge to hit its uh, natural frequency, which um, meant that it shook uncontrollably and collapsed, and I'm sure many of you have seen the video on that. But quite interesting um, uh, how that occurred, and as a result of it, a great deal was learned about vibration, bridge vibration, and natural frequency. Okay, the next one, the Box Girder Bridge. Now, another bridge. Um, uh, there was a collapse in Australia in 1970, and uh, uh, a later investigation revealed all sorts of problems in the bridge's fundamental design. There were other Box Girder Bridges that failed around, around the world in Wales and also in Germany. Um, as a result of all of this, as you would expect, the, the whole concept of the Box Girder Bridge was looked at in great detail. And um, it was discovered that there were some errors in the, um, 
stress calculations to do with it. The, the fundamental idea was a good one, but um, there were some errors in the actual calculations of stress. And as a result of this project, a, a tremendous uh, amount of effort was put into uh, developing finite element stress analysis. Now, at this time, this was in the early days of um, computers being available to individuals. And so a lot of this coincided and became very helpful. But the, the interesting things about this is that um, uh, very, very, very sad. When, it, when the bridge collapsed, uh, the Australian one, uh, the workers' hut was underneath it. So a great many people were killed because the bridge collapsed on top of the workers' hut. Um, I think such was the level of confidence that this design was okay that they just took it for granted. And um, essentially, the, the stress analysis calculations, there was a fundamental error in them. Um, but it wasn't discovered. Uh, until these failures occurred. So again, another example where um, a, a bridge failure, but there was a great deal learned from it as a result of it. And these days, box girder bridges are great. Uh, the design is effective and is being applied around the world. Challenger Space Shuttle, we all know about this one. Um, uh, but looking under the skin of each of these uh, design events is, is well worthwhile doing if you get if you get an opportunity to do that because you get under the skin of what really happened why did it happen what was the motivation and in this particular case um, the Challenger space shuttle project that launch was under a tremendous uh, uh, motivation to launch there was a great deal of pressure from all sorts of quarters to to just get it get it in space um, but there was really not enough data, not enough real understanding of what happens to um, a space vehicle like this and its components um, at very low temperature, uh, because the, the, the flight, uh, uh, the, the launch took place at a time when temperatures were very low. However, a lot of pressure on managers, a lot of pressure on engineers to, to go regardless. Um, uh, but this was quite interesting in that um, uh, previously the culture of NASA was to delay launching any space vehicle until a problem was really understood and properly solved. But before this problem with the O-ring, um, which, uh, which was the cause of the disaster, um, the there was an earlier example where an almost you might, in, in, I mean, in the safety terms, we might call this a precursor in that a senior NASA manager did not want to delay the project at any time because of booster design problems, which were then fortunately resolved before the launch. But the, the O-ring problem wasn't solved. And so um, this caused the disaster. Now, this is not so much, um, although it is a safety-related problem, what's interesting about this is that it is very visible. Um, it's very, very clear that um, the trains wouldn't fit the platforms. Um, uh, but of course, very embarrassing for France. But nonetheless, uh, any of us involved in projects can make this kind of error. Um, and it's very costly, uh, as well as embarrassing, that this problem is, has got to be resolved. Um, but the question that occurs to me is, what about uh, not just this project, but your projects, anything you're working on? What about those things which are not obvious? that um, are not visible. Uh, I mean, on this, there may be something else lurking in this, and I'm sure now that this has happened, SNCF are checking it very thoroughly. But you really do need to look beyond. You need to look underneath and really test it out. OK, the next uh, Formula One. Yeah, again, a lot happened in the 1970s that affected safe design in all sorts of industries. And this is, this is another area where design safety was coming to the fore. Um, the culture of Formula One at the time was a kind of um, an acknowledgement, an acceptance, that there might be one driver death per year. Uh, and it was accepted as being the normal. Um, however, it got, got a bit better. And then a decade or so went by, and there wasn't a, a race fatality. And so that may have changed the kind of risk appetite that, um, 
that the community, uh, both the drivers, the operators, and also the um, uh, people watching uh, Formula One, maybe their, their attitude changed. Because all of a sudden in 1994, there were two fatal accidents. Um, I, I, I think it, from memory it was Senna and uh, Ratzinger. Um, and that created a very big fraud. Um, and safety really did become first priority then. They really made it, although it was perhaps not stressed as much before, now it really became a big issue. And a lot of investment uh, took place in all aspects of Formula One, which have had a lot of beneficial knock-on effects, of course, into the main automotive sector. Um, the big, really big uh, benefit for Formula One drivers was the, the hands device, this head and neck safety device which um, massively increased driver neck protection, which, is, which is one of, was one of the main problems. So each of these particular cases gives a different facet to, to design and the issue of safety. Um, it's not a ticker box uh, solution with this. You have to really think carefully. You have to really get under the skin. And for my part, I think it's well worthwhile really exploring uh, errors, uh, design errors that have occurred in other sectors different from yours, where problems actually may be similar and where me lessons may be learned. So that's why I've started with looking at these cases. Now if we, we get into um, this, this interesting uh, issue of design and uh, being creative and being safe. Um, throughout my career, I mean, I've, I've spent most of my earlier career in product design, leading product design leading projects and so on. And um, in the safety critical industries in particular, there is this um, interesting uh, issue of being creative and being safe. Um, and the issue, well, how safe do you need to be? Um, is it a trade-off? Or can you be equally creative with a fantastic solution and yet also be safe? To my mind, yes, you can. There's no reason why not. It just requires a bit more thought. Um, and I think if you set for design engineers, designers, if you set a very high bar um, saying you want to achieve something which is much, much, much better than you have got so far, uh, eventually, like all engineers, we will, we will perhaps uh, resist it, maybe say it's not possible, you can't do that. But in time, engineers will come up with something that's... Um, a really fantastic solution. And uh, so I don't think there is the need be a compromise between creative design and being sufficiently safe. I think the big issue is what is the risk appetite? What is the safety risk appetite? And connecting with that. And that safety risk appetite isn't fixed. It changes, it varies depending on both the, the, the culture of the country you live in and also the company that you work for and other events. So. I think being, being plugged into uh, what is really the risk appetite is very important. So let's look at some projects now, different, different types of projects, built environment projects. Um, some of the obvious statements. Um, they start one day, they finish one day, there is a handover, and there is the issue of how you maintain uh, the building going forward. Uh, there are unique aspects to each project. Each project has some level of uniqueness. Um, and often uh, resources change through the project life cycle. The, the project may last four or five years, so people will change. And in changing, uh, that's a natural progression into the various stages of the project. But of course, there is a, a leaking, a potential leaking of project knowledge. Um, also, interestingly, the prototype and the deliverable may be the same. Um, uh, in most built environment projects, it's not possible or practical or financially feasible to uh, build a prototype of it. Um, you may be able to and often do prototype bits of it, but you won't be able to prototype the whole of it. So the, the prototype and deliverable may be the same thing. So it's usually one off, but it does use proven concepts Technical standards are very relevant, uh, methods, proven methods, um, a management system, a quality management system, a safety management system, a risk management system. All of these things are available and minimize the, the risk of, of uh, um, 
safety problems occurring on the project. Now, um, it's something we talk about a lot in our practice, uh, and, it, and it, sometimes it causes offence, but it's not meant to. It's meant to just uh, force some clarity, really. And that is that um, we talk about big safety, which is very much focused on making sure the thing is designed properly to the right level of safety that's been agreed. Um, it's about design decisions, and it's about understanding the risk appetite of the stakeholders. And the focus is very much on the users, the people who will use this thing once it's built, the people who will maintain it um, throughout its, the remainder of its working life. What we call little safety, and it's not, we're not drawing the dis dis distinction between big and little because we're, we're diminishing little safety. That's not the issue at all. But little safety is about the um, project health and safety. Uh, it's generally clear and well understood. Um, it's a big challenge, though, uh, throughout the project life cycle. Um, and often it's a grudge buy from those working on the project. Um, it, it's, uh, the situation has changed and improved dramatically over the years in the UK. But there are other countries around the world that, that we are working at the moment where it absolutely is not, not uh, accepted. And people do the most amazing things when working on a project site, risking their own, uh, their own safety. Um, and it ends on project completion and handover. So I think the reason we say big safety and little safety is that quite often these get confused on built environment projects from our experience. So I hope that's, that's interesting. I mean, one of the big questions which um, applies to all of this is um, how safe is safe enough? And this is an issue that's been addressed very much in the rail industry, which we'll be looking at, uh, looking at next. OK, uh, rail infrastructure projects, are, there are similarities with, with built environment. And you might say that uh, rail infrastructure projects are encompassed within built environment. But um, one of the biggest challenges is the very diverse technical disciplines that get involved. Um, and these technical disciplines have very different cultures, professional cultures, and quite different to each other. Um, and that, that creates uh, an interesting challenge when we're trying to ensure we build um, a safe railway, a railway that can operate for many decades, and, and also that we haven't built something in which, uh, which might cause a safety problem later on. Uh, we talk a lot about rail safety assurance um, and the definition that um, we're very familiar with and which we uh, 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 were involved in is one from uh, London Underground, which is um, it's the extent that defined requirements have been complied with and the control process has been followed in achieving the deliverables. Basically, it's not just about the outcome, but it's about the journey to get to the outcome. Um, and uh, just because you complete a project and say, right, it's perfect now, Mr. Client, here you are, you can have it now. Um, the client these days, uh, that's not acceptable. You've really got to demonstrate that you have followed a proper assurance process in order to, to deliver the, uh, the outcome, and you've got the complete audit trail of records and so forth to give that comfort and confidence. Um, the systems engineering V diagram is very important in rail. <clears throat> and um, standards, technical standards and management standards are very important in rail, as they are in, in many, many sectors. And this particular one is taken from um, a standard that uh, rail people will know very well, EN 50126. And uh, it shows the, the issue of verification and validation throughout the project life cycle. So on the, on the left hand uh, of the V, we're looking at design. We're looking at understanding what it is uh, uh, the customer needs, understanding um, the technical specification for that need, preliminary design, detailed design. And then we get into the, the right hand side of the V, which is building what's been designed. But throughout, it's important to verify i.e. look at each stage, the inputs and outputs to each stage to make sure that they're right, uh, and also validate um, uh, 
going back to the user, back to the uh, original concepts to make sure that we've got both veri verification and validation against the technical requirements. It's all about making this systematic, but challenging, robust, but flexible. And this is where it gets, uh, gets intriguing on, on rail projects, trying to get this right. Okay, um, we, we have various um, uh, what we call plans, which we think are fundamental to railway projects, rail infrastructure projects. One of these is called a SEMP, a Systems Engineering Management Plan. It's very much focused, as the name implies, how is this going to work as a system, particularly with all the different technical disciplines involved. Um, and it covers a whole host of different things, um, hazard identification, something we call RAMs, uh, and the standard for this is ISO 15288. Uh, we talked about RAMs. RAMs, again, very important, particularly in the design phase. It's focused, it's focused on making sure that um, uh, the design fits the need of the user and, and the, uh, as, the end of the as the project progresses. It's very dynamic. It should be updated. It should be changed as the project progresses. Value engineering plan throughout a project uh, where we always not only focus on safety, but we're also focusing on can we make it better, can we make it simpler, can we make it easier to maintain. And the process for value engineering, that's the focus here, uh, but that all also needs to be checked back with the SEMP and with the RAMS plan. Human factors integration plan. Here the focus, each one of these plans, as I've mentioned, has a different focus. And this particular plan is focused on uh, people. Uh, people who are going to use it. What are the risks to them? People who are going to maintain it. What are the risks to them? Um, how do we make sure that throughout the life cycle of this, this project, when it's handed over, that it's going to work OK, that it's going to be a safe railway? And is, is it going to, how is it going to operate when conditions are not perfect? Uh, maybe there are emergency conditions. Maybe it's degraded. Maybe it's not built in the way that was expected. All this kind of stuff, I think, needs to be needs to be focused on. Now, uh, moving on to um, the automotive sector. Now, this is a very, very different sector to built environment and to to rail infrastructure projects. Yes, of course, it starts one day and it finishes one day, and there's a launch. And but there is continuous development. Um, and there are unique aspects, and there is a continuous focus, uh, real heavy focus on safety improvement by design. Dedicated term, teams tend to work long term on uh, automotive projects. Uh, there is extensive modeling, extensive prototyping, lots of testing. And this is because products are made in large quantities. They're not one-offs. Um, so there is the opportunity and there is the demand, really, to um, get this right and really focus on how to um, make it work well. Now, there is this uh, methodology called advanced product quality planning, which is deeply ingrained in the automotive industry. And it's deeply ingrained up and down the supply chain. Um, and um, three of the main uh, uh, automotive manufacturers, American-based automotive manufacturers, Ford and so forth, General Motors, um, have worked collaborati collaboratively together to, to get this particular approach um, fundamental to the industry, spread throughout the industry. Um, and there is an ISO standard for it, which is ISO 16949. Um, and it, it focuses on this whole, it embraces APQP. This is very similar to, if you know Six Sigma, designed for Six Sigma. It's very much focused on uh, making sure the processes are right for the particular design being done. And it's, it's built from um, the design and product realization um, section of ISO 9001. But it's much, much deeper, much, much more involved. Okay, um, the focus, uh, I mean, we say this, it's directed to customer satisfaction, but it really is very deeply focused on customer satisfaction. And there is a great deal of effort that's gone into making sure and really understanding what it is the customer wants, particularly when they are, the customer is not able to articulate it 
It's about really getting under the skin of it. Um, um, and it's, it's about fixing the design early, um, particularly the safe aspects, getting it right from the start. Um, communication is key up and down the supply chain within the company. Um, and the aim is minimal or no quality problems. And of course, because it's, um, because it's uh, made in, in vast quantities, the, uh, the, the compelling need to get it right before you launch it is really, really important. We all know of situations where recalls take place. And that's a financial disaster as well as a reputational disaster for an automotive manufacturer. So the, the APQP system is, is um, deeply driven on this aspect to make sure that by the time um, uh, an automotive vehicle is launched, it's by and large okay. It doesn't always work though, as we know. So, um, it's a very quick run through, um, and I'm conscious that I'm really over, over running already, but let me just put up some, some ideas and thoughts about design leadership and assurance. These are not meant to be uh, too provocative, but basically saying, well, what, what do you think about this? Um, uh, technical decisions made by those most competent based on facts. Well, you may not always have the facts. And also, the interesting thing about decision making, the psychology of decision making, uh, which also needs to be looked at, is that uh, when it comes to safety, people, um, technical people, uh, managers, all of us, can sometimes take um, a rather, um, uh, uh, not an objective view on something. Uh, we, we may, uh, looking, at, looking at accidents, we may think that they were more predictable than they actually were. And so this issue is, is something that needs to be care carefully thought through. Another issue, should managers only make safety changes that improve design, not have the potential to do the opposite? Think deeply about safety very early. If you think about it early, you get it right early, the impact on cost is minimal. If you leave it to progressing through the project, the cost can be horrendous. And what about a culture where errors can be identified and vocalized without blame? Um, look at the cases again that we looked at earlier. This is really, really key. People need to be able to say that um, there is a problem here. The king hasn't got any clothes. We need to, they, uh, without, without their careers being damaged. That's one of the most difficult things I've found in my career to, for a client or a company to really have this working effectively. The prevailing risk appetite. Compliance with standards minimizes safety risk. Of course it does. And what's the protocol for managing when things go wrong? So just some ideas, some initial thoughts. Um, right, I'm conscious that I've overrun. My apologies for those of you um, who need to rush away. But if you have some questions, I'm very interested to, to look at those. Um, I hope it's been interesting. I hope it's been useful. Um, please don't hesitate to contact me if you need to discuss any other aspect. But I hope there's some ideas and thoughts there that, um, that, that are helpful.